Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started here, and, and we've got a, 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 a nice intimate group, so we can just kind of talk a little bit, or I'll, I'll talk a lot while you guys are eating your lunch, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about things like how to make your business a little bit more profitable, some things you guys can do that might, might help in that area. Um, first off, though, I kind of want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Dan Trottencheck. I'm with the North American Retail Hardware Association. Um, are you guys familiar with the NRHA and what we do? Um, probably one of the most visible things that, that we do is publish Hardware Retailing Magazine. Uh, the association, believe it or not, has been around for 117 years and Hardware Retailing has been around for about 115 years. So, so we've got a little time within the industry that, uh, that we've been doing the same stuff really for the past 117 years. Uh, NRHA, something you guys might not know, is, is we're a not-for-profit trade association. We, we, we don't have shareholders, we don't have owners. The closest thing we have to owners actually is, is you guys because um, we completely belong to the home improve, independent home improvement retailers in the United States and Canada. The entire reason NRHA exists is we, we, we're, we're not trying to make money for shareholders, we're not trying to make money for our ownership group. Our whole reason for existing is kind of encapsulated in our whole mission statement, which is to help independent hardware stores, home centers, and lumber dealers, regardless of wholesale affiliation, become better and more profitable merchants. So, so that's all we do, and that's what we try to do through the pages of hardware retailing as well. So it's always great that, that when I get the opportunity to come out and talk to you guys at events like this, one, I enjoy going to the events because it's an opportunity to kind of see what's going on and talk to and introduce myself to more retailers, but it's also a great opportunity for us to kind of just share some of the information that we get at NRHA with you guys. And, and I, let me ask you guys a question real quick. How many of you guys have your own research and marketing departments in your business? <laughs> Not too many of you guys? Okay. Well, well, that's kind of what we try and do in a lot of ways, is we try and go out, we do research all the time. So we try and go out and do this research just so we can share it with you guys. So, so it's exciting when we're able to actually get in front of you and you talk about this kind of stuff. So um, I want to start with a couple of points about store performance. Just to show a hands in here, who in here is hoping to have their sales increase this year over last year? All right, so you guys are planning for it. Anybody in here hoping sales are going to go down? Just, just wringing your hands about how can I drive these sales down? Well, I, I didn't think so. But um, the good news is, and, and uh, there was just another article about this out the other day, is, is the good news is this industry is healthy right now. Home building is coming back. And when people build homes, they invest in home improvement. Um, in fact, there was an article the other day that was talking about how hardware stores and home improvement stores are bucking this kind of brick and mortar retail trend of store closings. You know, a lot of people, like if you sit down next to someone on a plane or if you're sitting at a bar, not that any of you guys would be sitting at a bar, but if you're sitting at a bar talking to someone and say, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I run a hardware store. I'm sure you guys have heard before, oh, I'm so sorry. You, you know, and, and, and it's really a misconception. And there was this article that was talking about how hardware stores are doing well while Sears and JCPenney and, and Best Buy, I, I'm from Indianapolis, up by, anybody heard of H.H. Gregg, a big electronics retailer, shutting all its stores down. Well, at the same time, home improvement stores are doing all right. When we look at the overall retail sales versus what home improvement stores are doing, retail sales growth last year was at about 2%. Home improvement stores were about 5%. So, so this, it, this industry is doing well right now. So that's great news. That's good news for you guys. The bad news, or the more challenging news, is consumers are going to spend on home improvement. Are they going to spend it with you? And, and that's what you've got to be thinking about. There's more and more choices these days uh, for consumers about where they can spend their money. So I just like to set that up a little bit because one, you guys are hoping to grow your sales. The market is primed to help you grow sales. Consumers are out there looking for products. So you gotta look at what are the things I could do in my business to get those consumers who wanna spend money into my doors so I can grow sales. So 
That's kind of what we're going to talk about today. There's a lot of ways to do it, but I want to focus on just a couple while we're here today. But, but real quick, let me talk and share with you of what some other retailers just like yourselves are thinking. So toward the end of last year, we did some research at NRHA where we reached out to over 1,500 independently owned home improvement retailers, so people just like yourselves. And we asked them, how do you expect your sales in 2017 to perform versus 2016? And the good news is 71% of the retailers, just like you, said, I expect my sales to increase this year. I expect 2017 to be a stronger year than 2016, okay? Um, home centers were even more optimistic. So if any of you guys out there are home centers, a little bit more optimistic. The lumber dealers, who in here is a lumber dealer? A handful of you guys. You guys um, are a little bit uh, skeptical. I, I, think, I think coming out of maybe some of the recessionary times, you guys are like, well, okay, I'm not gonna get too excited about these opportunities for growth. But still, 57% of lumber yards said, we anticipate stronger growth in 2017 over 2016. Looking a little bit further out, so for the next three years, independent home improvement retailers are even more excited about growth opportunities. 78% of you guys are telling us that we see our sales growing. Now the year before, 84% of you guys were saying that, so it's a little bit softer year over year, but still, almost eight out of 10 of you say, I, I, man, the conditions are right to grow our businesses. So let me ask you, actually, before I go on to this, I'm gonna ask for some audience participation. What, I've been covering uh, retailing for, this is my 21st year at NRHA. So I've been, I'm a journalist by trade. I was a newspaper reporter, a sports writer, a business editor before I came to NRHA. But I've been focused on this industry for 21 years, on researching it, writing it, getting out and talking to you guys. And one thing that has someone who didn't come in with a retail background was kind of surprising. Do you know there are only three ways to grow your top line sales? Just three things you could do. Can anybody tell me what those three things are? Well, you're eating lunch. I'll get <laughs> you look like you're about ready to talk. Well, you, could, you could add new items, but you still gotta sell those items. So that's certainly one thing. Well, I'll, I'll let you eat and I'll tell you what those three things are. You could increase your prices. I got the key for growing your sales 50%. Go back and increase your prices 50%. Done. Easy. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? I mean, because the more you increase your prices, the less customers shop you. But there are ways to increase your prices, and increasing your prices has an impact on your top line sales. We're not talking about what you bring to the bottom line, but we're talking about what you sell out the front door. And you guys should always be thinking about are there opportunities for me to increase your prices? You should be aggressively, aggressively looking at variable pricing where you take back the pricing on some items, but you increase pricing on other items. So that's one way to increase top line sales. Second way is to get more people in your store. Increase the number of transactions. If you service 150 customers on a typical Saturday, man, get 175 customers in there. And you should be looking at ways to do that advertising your business, marketing your business, adding new niches and new inventory. Those are great ways to get more customers in your doors. But that takes time. You, you definitely need to focus on prices. You definitely need to focus on getting more customers into your doors. The third way, and really what we're gonna talk a little bit about further this morning to increase your top line sales is to increase your transaction size. To sell more stuff to the customers that are already in your doors. If you have those 150 customers coming through your doors on a Saturday and your average ticket is $25, if you sell them $27 and you increase your average ticket to $27, guess what? You've done a, had a dramatic impact on your top line sales. So why should you focus on transactions? Why are we gonna talk about that as it relates to merchandising? We're gonna, we're gonna certainly get to that. Um, you need to focus on all the things we talked about. You can't say, well, I'm not gonna worry about pricing, I'm not gonna worry about trying to get more customers in my stores. But why transaction size is so important is because one, you can have an impact this weekend in your business. You can do some things that are gonna make a change right away in the top line sales you have. 
Two, there are a number of ways you can impact your transaction size. You, you know, one of the easiest ways to do it, it's a model that, that one industry has perfected almost to the point that it's a running joke about the industry. How many of your cashiers, when someone's checking out, say, would you like this? Would you like fries with that? Can I supersize your Coke? The fast food industry has made an art form out of driving transaction size. The service industry at a restaurant, did you guys all go out to a restaurant last night? You know, a lot of you guys, some of you guys went out to a restaurant last night? Okay, maybe a bar, sir, we at the bar. <laughs> so if you're at the restaurant last night, what's the last thing that the waitress or waiter asks you? Would you like something for dessert? Or not even that, can I bring you my dessert, the dessert menu? Okay, well, are your cashiers as customers are going out saying, oh, did you need batteries today? Oh, I see you bought a hanging plant. Do you need some plant food today? What are those add-on sales they can drive at the register? So that's one way to increase transaction size. But it is so much, it's infinitely easier for you to sell more stuff to the customers once you have them in your store than trying to get new customers in, than working on your variable pricing and all those things. So that's the one way you can impact your top line sales right away. And you could get to the goals you want to get to for this year. So there's certainly some challenges to increasing transaction side. One, size. One, you know, as you're teaching your employees to do things like offer add-on sales and so on, you have to make sure they're not pushy. You don't want to offend your customers like, oh God, I can't go into the store without stuff just getting crammed down my throat. Um, you have to train your employees. It's easy to say, tell the cashiers to ask about this, but someone has to, I mean, uh, most cashiers are great, but sometimes it can be difficult to drive a point home and get them to do it the right way and all that kind of stuff. So, so you have to train employees. You also have to train your sales floor employees to do add-on and project-based selling. A note as we're talking about add-on and project-based selling, NRHA has training courses specifically geared toward training your employees how to do add-on and project-based selling. Um, but the right strategy for increasing transaction size, like I said earlier, involves a lot of elements. It's getting your employees trained. It's having the right products. It's having the right pricing so customers don't have to make a snap, don't have to think about, do I really want to buy that plant food because it's $29.99? Or, I mean, wow, $3.99 when I'm buying a hanging plant for $24 doesn't seem like that much of an investment. Sure, I'll buy it. So you have to have the right products. You have to have the right prices. And, and lastly, what we're going to talk about is having the right merchandising and the right merchandising approach. Um, and, and they talked a little bit about this this morning in the breakfast session, is how important good merchandising is in your stores. And the number one reason that I wanted to lead with this concept about driving sales is because people, you guys have got to start thinking about merchandising in terms of an investment in your business and not just an expense, not just a time suck, not just something that you have to do. It is, it, it, when done right, and we're gonna, I'm going to back this up with statistics and, and numbers. When done right, merchandising will put more dollars in your pocket. So it is an investment in your business that will and can pay off and pay off immediately by driving transaction size. Because merchandising does a lot of things. Um, also, guys... This whole presentation I'm going to make available to Wallace so they can, go, they can give it to you and any notes and stuff. And I'll have business cards and all that kind of stuff. So if anybody wants a business card and has questions, we def I definitely want to make sure you get whatever information you need out of this. So um, every year NRHA does something called our cost of doing business study. In fact, we are fielding data for this starting in a couple of weeks. If you don't participate in the study, I would encourage you, please participate in the study. Um, what we do is we ask you to give us uh, your financial information. It, none of this is used individually. None of this is supplied to anybody other than you. It's all used in aggregate. When the information comes into our office, it's your, your uh, uh, information is assigned a number. No one in our office can tell you who this information links back to. It, it just feeds into the study. But what you get back for participating in the study is you get an individualized report 
with the industry averages for every, num every financial number you could want to see and all the ratios, and you get the industry averages, you get what the high performance stores are doing, and you get where your store sits in that, in that mix. You also get a calculator that shows you, um, uh, a calculating tool that shows you if I change these things, if I can change my transaction size, if I can change my inventory turns, if I can change my expense side, what kind of impact will that have on my business? So, so please, I would encourage everybody to participate in the report. But nonetheless, these are the kind of numbers that the, the, the cost of doing business uh, uh, study yields for us. And this is the hundredth year we've been doing this report. Um, so for the 2016 study, the typical hardware store did about $1.6 million in sales. The high profit store did about 2.1 million in sales. Home centers, about 3.14. High profit, about 3.11. It's important to note that top line sales aren't always, um, aren't always what defines whether a store is profitable or not. So uh, th there are stores that'll do, I mean, let's look at a company like Amazon. I mean, <laughs> take it to the extreme. A Amazon does billions in sales, yet l yields very little net profit. Very, I mean, in fact, for years, up until two years ago, I don't think they yielded a profit. So top line sales don't, aren't necessarily reflective of, of what you do <clears throat> on the bottom line. But this kind of shows you what the stores were doing. 4.5 million at Lumberyards, 6.3 at high profit Lumberyards. The next slide is what I really want to show you though, because this was a, what we call a key profit variable. One of the things that was a key point of difference between the high profit stores in our study and the average stores, and it was transaction size. The average hardware store is giving transaction size of about $21 per customer. High profit store is 23. Home center is about $36 per customer at the average store, 51 at a high profit store. LBM about 157 per customer at a typical store and about 219 at a high profit store. So what these stores have in common is they have the training in place, they have the merchandising in place that is selling more stuff to the customers once they get them in their doors. So think about this. Another study that we did shows that an Average hardware store, based on our cost of doing business study numbers and based on other research we've done, leaves as much as $145,000 on the table every year through things like being out of stock on merchandise, not having the proper merchandising set up. <coughs> Would any of you guys like to see $150,000, $145,000 in additional gross profit dollars every year? That could, for a lot of you, got for, for, shoot, for, <laughs> for anyone, that could be business changing kinds of money. And it's just through disciplined things like training and thinking about merchandising that, and, and being vigilant and things like making sure you're not out of stock on products. Um, through those methods, you can get that. You could recover some of those lost dollars. And here's another statistic that relates back to transaction size and merchandising and in stock position. This is a time trade study, uh, their 2015 state of retail report. So this isn't an RHA, but 82% of the customers, they, of consumers they sur surveyed, said that they will typically buy more stuff when they go shopping. I mean, who does, uh, who in here does that? I mean, we're all consumers. You guys are retailers, but you're also consumers. How many times do you go to Target or Walmart or, or wherever it is and you think you're going in to buy a pair of tube socks and you, and you come away with uh, some pool noodles and, and, and a bag of candy and, and a watch or whatever else you get there. I mean, it happens all the time. So 82% of your consumers, of the customers coming into your store say, if the situation is right, I would spend more money. So how can you help them do just that? Let's talk about one way you can do it and one important thing that you can invest in merchandising. And I think it's important to note too that um, what, what uh, uh, Richard was talking about this morning from the stage was Wallace is here to help you guys with this too. I mean, they want to help you invest in your business. And, and Pro Group has tools that'll help you invest in your business and Wallace can help you invest in your business. So, so you're not in this alone. All this stuff we're gonna talk about too 
as you see it, a lot of it is more about mindset and discipline with merchandising, even as much as it is about making some kind of big investment in your business. So, what can merchandising do? I've said several times merchandising can do a lot of things. Number one, it can drive transaction size. Um, how does it do this? How does merchandising drive transaction size? Well, one, it brings products that you want to feature and puts them in front of a customer. It also does some things psychologically that we'll talk about in a second with customers in a lot of ways that gives them a sense of urgency in their buying decisions. Secondly, it max you could use merchandising effectively to maximize your sales floor space. One, you could do things like show customers that you, uh, that you have products that they might not have known because they're in a different area of the store from what, they're a uh, what their shopping occasion brought them for. Two, it can help you maximize your space. So something that, something that wouldn't be, you no, might not normally stock because you say, I don't know that I have the shelf space for that. Merchandising can help you find solutions for that. <coughs> Lastly, and you can't undersell this, quality disciplined merchandising, including signage, signage is part of merchandising. I'm not just talking about physical merchandisers. All of that stuff is really designed to help your customers. It's designed to show them the products you want to show them. It's designed to help them navigate your store better or to understand more about a product. So when you do merchandising and you do it right, and you make an investment in both time and um, resources to do your merchandising correctly, you're also creating a better shopping experience. Not only are you driving sales, but you're creating an atmosphere that customers are going to want to come back to. And like I said to begin with, if customers are going to spend money on home improvement, what are the reasons they're going to spend it with you? Well, a well-merchandised store is one of those reasons. So let's talk about the numbers that I'm going to share with you guys. Um, it was, let's see, uh, 2002 when NRHA last did, before what I'm, the numbers I'm going to give you, uh, a study that's called Merchandising for Profit. And we said, let's go out there and look at, okay, an end cap. What happens when you put a product on an end cap? How do you know if it's successful for you? What kind of sales lift does an end cap generate versus a dump bin, versus not having an item on an end cap? So you guys can understand, one, we could, we could illustrate how, uh, how great an impact these merchandising uh, uh, techniques can have, but two, also give you guys something that you can measure your merchandising performance by. So, um, 2002, we did it. It was a very popular study. I guarantee you a lot of people at, at, at Pro Group, at Wallace, had looked at the study and, and utilized it when they're thinking about things like designing merchandising uh, for you. Uh, so we said, well, 15 years is probably about enough time. Now we have to update the study. Why we thought it was important to update it now as well was because there's a lot of things that have changed with shopping. Um, D uh, looking around, I, I, I don't see a whole bunch of millennials in the room, maybe, maybe a couple, but do you think millennials shop a little bit differently than, 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 than normal people? I don't <laughs> <laughs> no offense, come on. <laughs> um, but well, we, all, we, all shop, we all shop differently today. One of the things that has changed is, uh, I mean, uh, shopping is now so tied to entertainment. People want to be entertained when they shop. People want access to information when they shop. They want to be exposed to new things because guess what? I mean, right now, if I wanted to take three minutes, if someone shouted a product at me, I could order it and, and probably literally by the time I get home, it could be waiting for me. So, um, you know, just a word on that, I always ask retailers about how they differentiate their operations and independent retailers typically say customer service and convenience. Are you more convenient than me pushing, literally pushing a button on my phone and having it waiting on my doorstep? So it's not to say there aren't ways you can comp compete on convenience, but if you're not thinking about things like how do I make that in-store experience interesting, fun, and it, at the very least, at very least pleasurable in a sense of shopping to my customers, I'm going to fall behind the curve even further on some areas. So uh, what did we do with the study? Just to talk a little bit about how we did it. We tested 13 different merchandising techniques. 
to see what they do, how they deliver, what kind of sales lift you can expect from them. And these are all of them and we'll go through most of them here. Um, we actually went out in the field and did this. This wasn't like a laboratory kind of thing. We worked with over 25 different retailers to put these displays in their stores, to stock products that were, season that, that were not necessarily seasonally affected, that fit well on the merchandisers, that fit well in the scheme and wherever we could, that replicated the, res uh, the, the products that we tested 15 years ago so we could see what kind of items have, what, what kind of, if there was any lift that had changed dramatically over the years. Um, we looked at sales at these stores during a 30-day period. We also had a complete control set of stores that were in the same markets. So it wasn't necessarily that we could, we could take out, you know, one market did well while well, another market just did bad for weather or some reason. So, so we were actually out in the field doing this. Um, after we got all the results back, we looked at the control data. We looked at the sales results from the test stores where we're testing the merchandising. We got rid of all the anomalies and outliers and arrived at the mean number, uh, the mean averages for sales left. Well, we talked about this. Why is it so important today? In-store merchandising techniques drive sales. It's always been important. Um, transaction size being a key differentiator. Merchandising playing such a key role in driving transaction size. That's more important today than it's ever been. And lastly, um, just the retailing environment we're, that we're in. You guys are looking for how do you maximize every inch of your square footage, how do you maximize every linear foot of shelving you have, and how do you get the most of it when you get a customer into your store. So let's, we're just gonna kind of blast through these findings just to illustrate to you what some of these different merchandising techniques can use. First, we wanna start with some of the big ones. Disposable dump bins. Just by moving the product, and we tested wasp spray in multiple markets, by moving wasp spray from its in-aisle position, keeping it in-aisle, but also moving it to a disposable dump bin, generated an average, this is a mean average, of 660% sales left. Uh, in 2002, it was 427% sales left. So these stores sold four times in 2002 and nearly seven times the amount of that product just by moving it to a temporary dump bin, okay? So before you start saying, well, I'm gonna go buy a, a, a truckload of temporary dump bins and I'll put everything in a temporary dump bin, part of the reasons these work so effectively is one, because they're temporary. When I was talking about customer psychology, I just touched on that a little bit. And, and it's interesting to read the works of a lot of these kind of retail sociologists who try and determine why are things like this effective? Why are things, uh, why, why do customers respond to certain things? One of the reasons customers respond to temporary dump bins is because that first word, temporary. The dump bin is, that, we're, that we tested was made out of cardboard. The stuff that was put in it was easy to pick up and put in a basket. Cust it, it, it psychologically sent a message to the customers this is only a temporary deal, I better take advantage of it now. Sure, it, it definitely drives sales because you can position it wherever you want in the store. You can put it in a power aisle, you can put it in front of the registers, so it creates awareness for a product that might, might have been somewhere else in the store. But secondly, it sends the message that this is, a, this is a deal that I might not get, I better take advantage of it. Permanent dump bins, and you can see the result when you test permanent dump bins. Permanent dump bins, about 86% lift. In 2002, they were a little bit higher at 197, um, but they still deliver a solid sales lift. If you put something in a permanent dump bin to, to understand that you could sell almost twice as many products by doing so, um, it makes you think that, you, you know, this is still a, an effective way to merchandise specialty and promotional items. And if anybody has any questions throughout this, just shout out. Yes, sir. No, the prices were the same. Yeah. Or if, if, the, if the prices were lowered in the dump bins, they were the same as, um, uh, they had to be the same during the pre-30-day period as they were during that 30-day period. And they had to be the same at the test stores. So. Power aisle stacks, 114% sales lift. Not, not everything can certainly be stacked in a power aisle, but just moving things into a power aisle stack. Um, these work obviously well with a single skew, larger item that you could do a stack out. Uh, fertilizer, bird seed, in this case we, trust, we tested trash cans. Um, 
just by bringing attention to these kind of seasonal items that customers are going to want to get, almost double sales. Um, we did two different kinds of stack outs, one with just a pro, uh, one with clearer signage and one without signage. They both delivered about the same, 83%. Uh, the, 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 the price signage definitely draws attention, so you're going to want to make sure to have price listed above the whole power stack instead of just individually on the items. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about some, you know, when we're looking at things like power aisle, some of the different ways retailers are using power aisle to also get creative and draw attention. So I just wanted to show a couple of things in here. Uh, this is a retailer, and I'm pretty sure this was in either South Carolina or Georgia. Um, the, they used a big section of their power aisle to kind of showcase featured merchandising. In this case, they were showing off Yeti coolers, grilling products, and outdoor living barbecue stuff. Um, and, and, and remember, this is not necessarily, I mean, they're selling the Yeti coolers and they're selling the barbecue grills, but this is also creating that atmosphere through their merchandising that's going to be an entertaining place for customers to come and, and shop. Um, another idea a, a retailer did, uh, this, this isn't too, too hard to guess, I guess, for, for most of you probably wouldn't be, but, but leading up to adding a particular product line to his store, they covered this up and they surrounded it with caution tape and they were asking customers to guess what product line they were adding at the store. Can anybody tell what that is? Grill. Grill, no. <laughs> no, actually it was bird feeders, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it was a grill. But, but again, he kind of created this interesting environment because he was getting ready to set that area with barbecue grills that he hadn't had before and he just wanted to give the customer something to talk about. Um, all right, moving on to service counter displays. Uh, if you're not utilizing your service counters, in a second we're going to talk about checkouts, to actually display products. And again, back this up by getting your salespeople and your service people to understand something like WD-40, for instance, which was chosen for a reason. That could be an add-on sale that you could ask everybody that comes through the register. Oh, did you notice, by the way, we have a special price on WD-40. Here you go. Um, and I'm not just making this up. There was a retailer out in Oregon who every year they would have, uh, they would sell hanging baskets. It was about around this time of year, leading up to Mother's Day, they have a big hanging basket sale. They decided we were gonna sell a bottle of plant food, at the bottles of plant food at the register, and they told every cashier, every customer that comes through with a plant, say, would you like to buy a bottle of $4.99 plant food to go with that? their conversion rate was over 80% on those sales. So eight out of 10 customers added a $5 high margin sale to their purchase, okay? Um, so it, again, just putting the products out, not having the, the people at the service counter ask, increased uh, uh, sales on that item by 85%. Checkout displays. Um, this is a horrible picture too, I apologize for that. <laughs> but uh, we tested super glue at the checkout display. 467% product sales increase. This is one area that has seen significant growth since the first study. Can anybody ha hazard a guess why that is? Because every place you go, they're doing this. Every store you shop at, they're adding products to the checkout area. Um, this is a new trend in retail store design. It's called single queue checkout. And it started, believe it or not, in the electronics industry, but now it's starting to seep into other industries and I am seeing more and more and more hardware retailers do this. And you don't have to be a big store to do this. Um, so what this is, is a bank of registers. Every customer that's gonna check out has to funnel along this, I, I'm guessing it's probably 32 linear feet of product, then come around the backside and look at more product. And then they go to the registers. It's actually even a more efficient way to check people out, but guess what, you're, you're exposing them now to probably 48 feet of additional impulse product that they might not have seen before. So, what I'm saying is the reason that, 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 that customers are so reactive to buying stuff at the, at the checkout now is because they've been trained to do that. It used to be, you know, supermarkets did a great job with this. You know, 
you're checking out, there's the magazine with the Kardashians on the cover that you've just got to have. You, you buy that, you buy your pack of gum. Um, and, and now, everyone's doing it. So if you're not taking advantage of merchandising your checking at checkout area, you are missing out huge on driving your transaction size. Clip strips. Does anybody in here use clip strips? One of you guys, two of you guys. If, if you're not using them, they should be all over your store, guys. Um, in aisle, they generate about a 25% increase. We tested them with work gloves. Uh, we didn't test them because really, I'm not gonna say definitively, they didn't exist in 2002, but they weren't in wide use in 2002 in a retail format. Um, but they do a couple of things. One, they drive the sale of product. They help, you, they help you merchandise area that would otherwise just be kind of dead to you. You're not using that area anyway. But what they help you do is cross merchandise. Look at the product we tested. We tested Jersey work gloves in the lawn and garden area. Now those might be merchandised somewhere else around rakes, but putting them right smack in a customer's face around rakes really creates an impact. But just wait till you see this next slide. Clip strips on an end cap. 177% increase in product sales. Same exact product tested, Jersey work gloves, hanging off an end cap that, by the way, if you didn't have the clip strip, you'd just have nothing there, so you're generating zero sales off that space. But by adding a clip strip, these stores sold twice as much, almost twice as much product as they would have otherwise sold. And why is that? Because it allows you to cross merchandise. It's a cross-functional display. Now customers that are buying their Weed Be Gone and buying their, their lawn and garden amendments can grab their work gloves right there so they don't have to think, oh, I need work gloves with that. Let me go find where they are in the store. They're right in their face. And two, you're use, utilizing one of the most valuable areas of your store, your power aisle. In aisle feature benefit sides. Um, if you're not looking at using these, it is a very, it's something that doesn't require a lot of investment. We actually, to make sure the signage was easy to do and to make sure it was uniform across the stores we tested, we created the signage and sent it out to the retailers. Um, and back in 2002, it only created a 6% lift. Today, it's almost a 40% lift in sales of products. And one of the reasons for this, as we got around and talked about it, and then we talked to consumers about it, is today's consumer is very used to getting additional information about products. When you go online, you get customer reviews. When you go online, it has bullet points about the product and its features and benefits. Sure, manufacturers put a lot of that stuff on packaging. Sure, your people might be trained to deliver that information, but when you put it out and you put it on a sign like this, it can achieve a lot in your store. What we did was we tested LED bulbs and the signage simply said, last eight times la uh, longer than standard bulbs, Abishan Hardware. And just by doing that, this was something that they printed out at the store, was able to increase 37%. Now, I mean, you could use these as liberally as you'd like, but you, it has to have meaningful information on it to some degree to draw attention to products. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the effect. This is a, a, a retailer that uses these, and I think these are great. Um, she does a couple of things with them. One, she points out some of the greener options in her, in her operation. Um, so if there's cleaners, she'll point, put, put, put them on, on, on particular items that, that are more, uh, uh, environmentally friendly, but something else she does um, is she and her staff will do like staff picks of merchandise. And her name is Willow, Willow Yoder. And um, so she has these little stickers with like a little caricature of her that are Willow's picks. And she's also done a really good job of getting kind of her face out there in the community so people know she's kind of an environmental activist, she's kind of a pet lover. So she has these little things throughout the store that again, it makes the shopping experience fun, it draws attention to the product, and it capitalizes on some of that impact that like we were talking about with, with people who are used to seeing consumer reviews and peer reviews on places like Amazon. All right. Let's get a little bit to the end caps because everybody has end caps. Um, so we tested end caps in a variety of ways. 
And our findings were kind of interesting on end caps in that quite honestly, when we look at all the different types of end caps, there are certainly things you could do on end caps that are more effective than others. But overall, the impact of end caps hasn't changed much in 15 years. They're still a great way to drive additional awareness of products and also to drive additional movement of products, but you probably knew that. The biggest thing we wanted to test and, and, and the hypothesis we wanted to check was whether or not the impact of end caps had diminished at all. And, and, and just kind of as a blanket statement, we were glad to see that it really hadn't. So we tested feature end caps with percent off signage, and then we tested it with sale signage. And what we found, was that just in general, sale signage did a better job of driving results than percent off signage. Um, customers were still responding to this concept of, ooh, this is on an end cap, ooh, this is on sale. And, and I know it's a microsecond to think about what percentage it is, but when you say 10% off, they have to immediately calculate, well, do I know the price of an item, and, and what is 10% off good or bad, or what is it? So just the word sale, is make such an impact that customers think, oh, sale. So, um, so and again, from 38% to 53%, it isn't overly dramatic, but still, sale signage still proves to be a slightly more effective at driving attention and movement off of an end cap. Um, we looked at single item end caps, uh, driving sales by about 11%. The reason you'll continue to see that 25% number from 2002 is because we just tested end caps in 2002 and we tested some different signage, but, but where we didn't have the single item, double item, or, or, or so on end caps, we just have the percentage. But um, very nice, well-signed end cap with you know nicely fronted, good looking product on that. And they got about 10, 11% lift on products on average. Um, same product tested on multi-item end cap, sales were up by about 63%. So what we find is that a multi-item end cap generally does a better job of increasing sales lift than a single item end cap. Well, you know, when you think about it, this is kind of logical because one, within the end cap, you're driving add-on sales. So someone's gonna buy a gas can and the gas treatment instead of just buying a gas can. So, so there's more opportunity for sales. Other, uh, the other thing is, you might see someone coming in for, uh, coming in for one thing and, and noticing they needed another. So, so the products are working kind of in harmony to drive sales for one another. So it's not particularly surprising that that's a little bit greater lift. Um, some of the trends we are seeing in end caps is the integration of video monitors. Uh, we wanted to test this and see what video, video monitors would do to drive sales increase, but technologically it just turned into to kind of a nightmare because so much is dependent upon what you're running and getting 26 stores that have video monitors on end caps to be running the same stuff was just kind of maybe, maybe 10 years when we test it again, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it, video monitors. But um, does anybody have any questions about the kind of sales lift you can generate um, or about the study itself? Uh, the point I just want to drive home is, is really going back to where we started, is that if you are looking and hoping, and the, those of you who raised your hands, that you want to see sales increase, what are you going to do to get there? Are you just going to hope that more customers come through your doors and, and look at the same merchandise they did and shop the same sales you had, and you're just going to hope that another competitor doesn't come in that's going to do a that's going to be thinking about doing things differently cuz unfortunately th that's what a lot of businesses tend to do is say yes sir i think sales are going to go up what are you going to do differently well there's just more houses being built okay well if there's more houses being built in your area that's that's a great that's a great way to to, to generate sales until someone comes along and says uh, ooh well i see a market that i don't think is getting the, they're getting the most out of I'm going to go ahead and put a store in there, or I'm going to find a different way to service that market. So if all that's happening, what are you going to do to take advantage of it? So one of the things that we talked about today, well, two of the things actually, that don't require any major investments are thinking about developing a disciplined merchandising strategy, really thinking about what items you're going to do in places like end caps, looking for opportunities to utilize things. Cardboard dump bins don't cost a lot of money. I mean, you could see based on 600 percent and some odd 600 change percent in item lift, you could pay over a weekend for two or three 
uh, temporary dump bins just with the additional sales. And then you could use them over and over again, okay? So it's, it's, it doesn't have to be a big thought process. Printing out feature benefit signs does not have to be a big investment. If you are gonna make an investment to grow your business, which you should be thinking about, we, we established this morning that, that, that Pro Group has got ways to help you out thinking through the process and even helping you pick the items that make sense and the, and the planograms that make sense for you. Wallace is saying, we'll help you, we'll, we'll, we'll give you, we'll, we'll invest in you as well. So, so really, merchandising is a great place to start, thinking about driving transactions in other ways, and how does your merchandising work together with your sales force to drive those transactions in your store? That's another great way. So I, I guess in closing, I'm not saying, guys, go out and we need to start writing some six-figure checks to start improving your business. It's just thinking about things differently, and just going back and saying, I'm gonna drive my top-line sales, here are the different ways I'm gonna do it, now let's go execute. And how am I gonna become a better retailer because of it? So in-store merchandising, still a key component. Uh, 14, 15 years since last study. Um, not a whole lot has changed, which is good, but there are different merchandising techniques that have emerged, like clip strips, the importance of things like dump bins, the impact of checkout merchandisers that are really even more impactful today than they were 15 years ago. And again, lastly, thoughtful merchandising best practices can drive results even higher, but it just takes that thought, took, just takes that planning and execution. Um, lastly, just thanks. We worked with the Farnsworth Group out of Indianapolis uh, on the study. These companies helped us field, uh, field the research so uh, we appreciate it. it was in the United States and Canada. All right, does anybody have any questions, thoughts they want to share? All right, guys, well, uh, lastly, NRHA, again, just like Wallace and just like Pro Group, we're here to help you. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out. We have training materials on how to merchandise, all of the report stuff that we have here, we can get to you. We have, stuff, we have training materials on how to teach your employees how to do project-based selling, how to do add-on selling, all that kind of stuff. We're here to supply you with that information, our cost of doing business study. Please participate in it. But if not, if you have questions about numbers off of the cost of business, give us a call and, and, and that's all we exist for is to help you guys out. So thank you all very much and I hope you have a great market.